So, as an anthropologist, I am, as Pedro already mentioned, <laughs> I've been very interested in how change happens in people and in communities and in societies. This issue brought me to the Romanian mountains where I lived with shepherds and with peasants to research their life stories in the context of huge political and economic change over the 20th century. And I carry with me these stories that these people told me when we were sitting around in simple rooms or working around the house or in the fields. Life's threads have led us together. It is midsummer, the afternoon sun is drawing small shadows and the heat is rising from the tarmac. Me, a young researcher in rural Romania, and next to me, <laughs> Valentina, in her late 70s, with a broad frame, dark headscarf, and bl blue plastic flip-flops. She is knitting socks from local sheep wool. We sit quietly for a while on the bench outside her courtyard. A feeling that accompanied me in the presence of other villagers returns. How is it possible to weave the million small, enormous, difficult steps to raise a family and live a life into a narrative directed towards a stranger who doesn't know the first thing? There is not much to tell about my life, Valentina told me at the beginning. Then we settled down our racing thoughts and started somewhere. We connected. With the initial reluctance to talk fa fading fast, the talk meandered. And it led from the cows to the neighbor's children to Valentina's own children, some of which have died prematurely, to the back pain that was gripping her so tightly that her breath grew short, to this um, old, lame, white horse that was roaming the village like a ghost, to the way in which there were so many cars in the village now, to the songs that she used to sing at school. She talked about her age, her frail health, and her loss as restricting her movements. Her story, although unique, resembles that of other villages in the valleys that I lived in. It was one of progressive disconnection, but also one of attempted reconnection. Distance was seen as a fundamental disconnector in these people's lives, as they were poor and had limited possibility to travel. Also, growing old was perceived as a disconnector because they were seeing as disconnecting the self from the community, as their families dissociated, as their children moved away to the cities, and as people died around them, and as with their kind of shrinking health, um, even the distance towards the shop or the church was growing quite large. It took a lot of courage for Valentina to keep reconnecting in a world that seemed kind of hellbent on development and civilization, a world that devalued the knowledge and skills of the older generations, and that kind of drew the younger generations into a quite uncertain future. Any of you recognizes the moment of deep connection with another human being? And any, as any of you knows, it takes courage to make that connection. Isn't that strange? Should we not be happy and joyful and eager to make that connection? But you and I know the anxieties that lie between self and connection. It is to be vulnerable. It is to be acknowledging that autonomy flows from interdependence and not the other way around. And this kind of acknowledgement doesn't come very easy in our culture. I would like to propose to you the difference between the small courage embedded in minute acts of kindness and connection and the larger-than-life courage that is often branded about by what I like to call a superhero world. Now you tell me superheroes don't really exist, but if they did, they could fix messes in a night, just changing their costume. I feel strongly that no quick fix is going to alter our world overnight like that, but um, I like the idea of costumes. But um, the separation idea of self has been debunked by many areas of science um, as an error born from what one can term broadly the modern Western ways of self, life, and being. My experiences in Romania made salient the ways in which we humans in the West have come to imagine ourselves as entirely separate from each other and from the environment that surrounds us. And we feel disconnected more often than connected. We have cultural institutions that separate and cut. These include um, private property and wage labor, for instance. But what we also do is 
we disconnect and lock up those parts of aspects of ourselves and of our society that we don't like to be faced with, like um, the mentally ill or the el our elders. Even the concept of elders we don't really use very much. And these social patterns illustrate larger symptomatic cultural choices that we keep making every day. The multiple crises that these kinds of choices lead to in our ecological, our economic and our personal spheres are now very visible. After working in Romania, I came back to live in my native Luxembourg. I was still interested in social change, but I really felt strongly that one needed to take the environment into account when thinking about the changes that are happening at the moment in society. I also wanted to reawaken the activist part of myself that had been lying dormant during my life with science. I founded the Center for Ecological Learning Luxembourg, CELL, a grassroots organization that is concerned with the social and ecological aspects of resilience and the transition to a post-carbon world. It's inspired in both structure and content by the forms that are found in nature. And resilience is the capacity of human beings to adapt to radical change very creatively and in funky ways. Sal uh. intends to make the world a more resilient place by redesigning our landscapes through ecological design. This is to regain local food security, seeing that we have given up our autonomy by our willingness to depend on extraneously sourced food and resources. Our current culture, as you may well know, rests on a very rather um, tenuous assumption that of infinite resources and infinite growth on a finite planet. The way in which cell imagines itself is like a mycorrhizal network. In 2008, and rather late in my education, I would like to say, um, I found out that in a forest, the most important things are not the trees. Um, but in fact, they're not, they're not very autonomous. They're um, connected by an underground mycorrhizal network, I, it's a fungal network, which acts as the 3D superhighway of the forest soil, and it transports the nutrients across large distances underground, and thus enables lived interdependence between very different species. For me, this came as a revelation, as nobody had told, told this to me in school, and I thought it was quite important to know. Um, beyond growing food and doing gardens, cell kind of acts like a mycorrhizal network to get people together to sincerely and experimentally live as though being connected to one another and the environment mattered. The underlying cultural issue at the heart of phenomena such as climate change and resource depletion is fundamentally one of disconnection. The thing is the following. The flaws inherent in the separation way of being in the world that I felt so strongly in Romania and in Luxembourg are confirmed by the science of ecology, which fundamentally states that connection is the key condition of life. In evolutionary terms, for instance, single cells grouped together because the capacity for life was thus enhanced. Um, in this way of looking at the world, it is a very much deeply interconnected place, and it only exists because of the quality of the relationships that shape it. Only if you were connected could you be disconnected. The other way just simply is logically as well as practically flawed. Spending time with practitioners of permaculture, I keep noticing that this kind of longing for connection is something that remains at the forefront of any deliberate effort towards a more resilient world. This longing becomes embedded in the minutest of actions, reflected in every gesture. Through their work in designs, in gardens, and through collaborative decision-making processes, permaculturists intuitively understand the need to take action towards reconnecting the world. It is not the one of superhero task, but it's one of many small steps of connection, woken up and rekindled every day by the pressures, the joy, as well as the grief towards the world itself. <coughs> In this full and authentic connection, nothing needs to be separated. There is space. This longing for an authentic connection, I want to add, is not a nostalgic call for a return to a supposed horizon of um, the pre-modern enchanted world is the dawn of something entirely new with entirely different premises. The way in which we can counteract the tendency towards this connection is through practicing in our everyday gestures small acts of courage which are fundamentally acts of connection. If we think about the world in this way, we come very much closer 
to having a healing relationship with the people around us and the world itself. Thank you very much. Thank you.